Metro 2033, Dmitry Glukovsky, Chapter 10, No Pasaran. There were no patrols visible in front of Pavletskaya Station, just a group of disheveled people sitting 30 meters from the station's exit, moving aside to let the revolutionaries trolley pass and watching it respectfully. Oh, what, nobody lives here? asked Artyom, trying to make his voice sound calm. He certainly did not want to be left alone in this deserted station without weapons, food, and documents. At Pavlitskaya. Comrade Rusikov looked at him with surprise. Of course they do. So why is there no border guard? Artyom persisted. Because this is Pavlitskaya, Bonsai interrupted, enunciating the syllables for emphasis. Who would bother it? Artyom thought to himself how much he agreed with the ancient sage who said, as he was dying, that the only thing he knows is that he knows nothing. They all talked about the inviolability of Pavletskaya Station as if it needed no explanation, as though it was something everybody understood. What you mean you don't know? Bonsai was incredulous. Just wait and see it for yourself. Pavletskaya Station captured Artyom's imagination at first glance. The ceilings were so high that the flickering flashes of light from the torches that protruded through rings hammered into the walls did not reach the ceiling, creating a frightening and bewitching sense of the infinite directly overhead. Enormous round arches were supported by slender columns that somehow managed to support the mighty vaults. The space between the arches was filled with bronze castings, tarnished yet evocative of their past greatness. And although these were only the traditional hammers and sickles, framed as they were by arches, these half-forgotten symbols of a destroyed empire looked as proud and defiant as they did when they were forged. A never-ending row of columns, interspersed with the wavering, blood-colored torchlight, faded off into the incredibly distant haze, and even there it seemed never to stop. The flames that licked the graceful marble pillars a hundred or a thousand paces away seemed simply unable to penetrate the dense, almost palpable gloom. The station once was, to be sure, the residence of the Cyclops, and therefore everything here was gigantic. Did no one dare to encroach upon it simply because it was so beautiful? Bonsai shifted the engine to idle. The trolley rolled slower and slower, gradually coming to a halt while Artyom kept looking intently at the strange station. What was it all about? Why did nobody bother Pavletskaya? What was so sacred about it? Certainly not only because it looked more like a fairy tale underground palace than a building built for the transportation industry. A whole crowd of ragged and unwashed urchins of all ages gathered around the stopped trolley. They enviously eyed the machine. And one even dared to jump down onto the track and touch the engine, respectfully silent, until Fyodor drove him away. That's it, comrade Artyom. Here our paths diverge, the commander interrupted Artyom's thoughts. I talked things over with the other comrades, and we decided to give you a little present. Here you go. And he handed Artyom a submachine gun, probably one of those taken off the killed security guards. And here's something more. He placed in Artyom's hand the lamp that had lit the way of the fascist in the black uniform with that mustache. These are all trophies, so take courage from them. They are rightfully yours. We would stay here longer, but we mustn't delay. Who knows how far the fascist bastards will decide to chase us, but they certainly won't dare to stick their noses into the Pavletskaya. Despite his newly acquired firmness and resolve, Artyom's heart throbbed unpleasantly when Bonsai shook his hand, wishing him success. Maxim slapped him on the shoulder in a friendly way, and bearded Uncle Fyodor thrust him a half-drunk bottle of his potion, not knowing what else to give him. There you go, buddy. We'll meet again, and we'll be alive. We won't die! Comrade Rusikov shook hands once again, and his handsome, manly face grew serious. Comrade Artyom... In parting, I would like to tell you two things. First, believe in your star. As comrade Ernesto Che Guevara said, hasta la victoria, siempre. And second, and most important, no pasaran. All the other soldiers raised their right hand in a fist and repeated the slogan, no pasaran.
There was nothing left for Artyom to do but to also raise his fist and shout the refrain with just as much resolve and revolutionary fervor, No Passeron! Although for him personally, the whole ritual was just gobbledygook, but he didn't want to spoil the solemn moment of his departure with stupid question. Apparently he did everything right, as Comrade Rusikov looked at him with pride and satisfaction, and then solemnly saluted him. The motor revved louder and, enveloped in a blue-gray cloud of smoke, accompanied by an escort of delighted children, the trolley vanished into the darkness. Artyom was completely alone again and farther from home than he had ever been before. The first thing he noticed, as he wandered along the platform, were the clocks. Artyom counted four of them right away. At the VDNKH, time was something rather symbolic, like books, like attempts to set up schools for the children, a demonstration that the station residents continued to care, that they did not want to degenerate, that they were still human beings. But here, it seemed, clocks played some other kind of role, a much more important one. Wandering about some more, Artyom noticed other strange things. First, there were no living quarters of any kind at the station, except for some hitched-up subway cars on the second track and on into the tunnel. Only a small part of the train was visible in the hall, which is why Artyom did not notice it right away. Tradesmen of every imaginable kind, and workshops were all over the place. But there wasn't a single tent to live in, not even a simple screen behind which one could spend the night. Some beggars and tramps were lying around on bedding made just of cardboard. People bustling about the station approached the clocks from time to time. Some, who had their own watches, would anxiously check them against the red numbers on the display panel and then go about their business again. If Khan were here, thought Artyom, it would be interesting to hear what he would have to say. Unlike Kitai Gorod, where people showed lively interest in travelers trying to feed them, to sell them something, to get them to visit somewhere, here everyone seemed preoccupied with their own affairs. They had no business with Artyom, and his sense of loneliness, which at first was displaced by curiosity, grew stronger and stronger. Trying to ward off a growing depression, he continued observing his surroundings. Artyom expected to see people here who were somehow different, with their own characteristic facial expressions, since life at a station like this could not help but leave its mark. At first glance, people were bustling about, shouting, working, arguing, just like anywhere else. But the more closely he looked, the more the chills went up and down his spine. There was a startling number of young cripples and freaks, one without fingers, one covered with disgusting scabs, with a crude stump in the place of an amputated third hand. The adults were frequently bald and sickly. There were almost no healthy, strong people to be found. Their stunted, deformed look offered a painful contrast to the dark expanse of station in which they lived. In the middle of the broad platform, there were two rectangular apertures leading into the depths, the passageway crossing over to the ring toward the Hansa. But there were neither Hanseatic border guards nor checkpoints, as there were at Prospect Mir. And someone had once told Artyom that the Hansa held all its neighboring stations in an iron fist. No, there was clearly something strange going on here, so he did not venture to the opposite edge of the hall. For starters, he had used five cartridges to buy himself a bowl of chopped grilled mushrooms and a glass of putrid, bitter-tasting water. He swallowed the muck with disgust, sitting on an overturned plastic box that had once held empty bottles, then he went over to the train, hoping to get a bit of a rest there, since his strength was failing and he had been feeling more and more sick as he looked around. But the subway train was quite different from the one at Kitai Gorod. The cars were all torn up and completely empty, with the seats burnt and fused together. The soft leather sofas had been pulled out and carted off somewhere. There were blood stains everywhere, and cartridge cases gleamed darkly on the floor. This place was clearly not a proper shelter but more like a fortress that had withstood more than one siege. Not much time had passed while Art Yom looked over the train, but when he returned to the platform, he hardly recognized the station. The counters were empty, the hubbub had died down, and, except for a few tramps clustered on the platform, not far from the transfer passage, 
there was not a single living soul to be seen on the platform. It had become noticeably darker. The torches were extinguished on the side where he had come into the station, and only a few were burning at the center of the hall. But in the distance, at the opposite end, a dying fire was still burning. The clock showed it to be a little after eight in the evening. What had happened? Artyom hurried on as quickly as the pain in his body would allow him. The crossing was closed on both sides, not just with the usual metal doors, but with sturdy iron gates. It was exactly the same on the second stairway, but one of the gates was still half open, and behind it could be seen solid latticework, welded like the casements at Tverskaya Station with heavy reinforcement. Behind that had been placed a table, feebly lit with a small lamp at which sat the guard, a washed-out gray-blue figure. No admission after eight, he snapped, when asked permission to enter. The gate opens at six in the morning, and turning away he let it be understood that the conversation was over. Art Yom was taken aback. Why did the life of the station come to an end after eight in the evening? And what was he to do now? The tramps, having crawled into their cardboard boxes, looked positively repulsive, and he didn't want to go near them, so he decided to try his luck at the fire, which glimmered at the opposite end of the hall. It was clear, even from afar, that standing at the fire was no group of tramps, but rather border guards, or something of the kind. Silhouetted against the fire, they seemed to be strong male figures, with the sharp contours of automatic weapons visible. But what was there to guard? Sitting there on the platform itself, guard posts should be set up in the tunnels, the entrances to the station. The farther away, the better. But here, if some sort of creature crawled out or bandits attacked, the men on duty would not be able to do anything about it. But drawing closer, Artyom noticed something else. From behind the fire, a clear white light flashed, seemingly going upwards, but too briefly, as if cut short at the very beginning not striking the ceiling, but disappearing, contrary to all the laws of physics, after a couple of meters. The searchlight was illuminated infrequently in distinct intervals, which is probably why Artyom had not noticed it earlier. What in the world could it be? He walked up to the fire, politely said hello, explained that he was traveling through and didn't know about the closing of the gate, and so missed it. He asked whether he might take a rest here, with the patrolman. Uh, 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 take a rest, sneered the man nearest him. He was a disheveled, dark-haired man with a large, fleshy nose. He was not tall, but was seemingly very strong. It is not a place for resting, kid. If you last till morning, you'll be doing fine. To the question of what was so dangerous about sitting by the fire in the middle of the platform, the man said nothing but only gestured behind him with a nod of the head, to where the searchlight was switched on. The others were busy with their conversation and did not pay Artyom the slightest attention. Then he decided he would finally find out what was going on around here and went over to the searchlight. What he saw there surprised him, but explained a lot. At the very end of the hall, there was a little booth, such as you sometimes see near escalators, for obtaining transfers to other lines. Bags were piled up around it, reinforced here and there with massive iron plates. One of the patrolmen was taking the cover off an extremely formidable-looking type of weapon, and the other was sitting in the booth. On it was mounted the very searchlight that was shining upwards, upwards, with no damper, no barrier here, and not even a trace of one. The steps of the escalator began right behind the booth, leading up to the surface. And that was where the beam of the searchlight struck, anxiously probing from wall to wall, as if trying to find someone in the pitch darkness, but only picking up some kind of some kind of brownish lamp frame, and the damp ceiling from which enormous chunks of plaster were peeling off, and beyond. Beyond that, one could see nothing. Suddenly everything fell into place, for some reason. Here, the metal damper that usually separated a station from the surface was missing. It was missing both from the platform and from above. Pavletskaya was in direct contact with the outside world, and its residents found themselves under constant threat of attack. They breathed contaminated air, drank contaminated water, which is probably why it tasted so strange. That was why there were so many more mutations here among young people than, for example, at the VDNKH. 
That was why the adults looked so sickly, their skulls exposed and polished to a shine, their bodies worn out and subject to decay. They were gradually being devoured by radiation sickness. But still, that was not all, apparently. How could one explain the fact that the whole station died after eight o'clock in the evening and that the dark-haired duty officer by the fire had said that surviving until morning was a big deal? Trembling, Artyom approached the man sitting in the booth. Good evening. The man returned his greeting. He was about fifty, but already quite bald, his remaining gray hairs tangled at the temples and the nape of the neck. His dark eyes looked curiously at Artyom, and his unpretentious laced-up flak jacket could not conceal his rotund stomach. A pair of binoculars hung on his chest, along with a whistle. Have a seat. He pointed Artyom to the nearest sandbag. <sighs> Those guys over there are having a grand old time, leaving me here alone to bore myself to death, so... Let's have a chat. Hey, did you hit someone's fist with your eye? And so the conversation began. As you see, we haven't been able to do anything halfway decent here, the duty officer explained sadly, pointing to the aperture leading to the escalator. You would need concrete here, not iron. We tried iron, but it was no good. In the autumn, every damn thing is swept away by water. First it builds, then it breaks through. It happened several times, and many people perished. Since then, we've been getting by like this. Only life is not tranquil here like it is at other stations. We are always waiting. Scum can come crawling in on any given night. During the daytime, they don't bother us because they're either sleeping or roaming around on the surface. But it's after dark that things really get desperate. So we've adapted here, of course, and after eight o'clock, Everyone goes into the passageway, where we live, and those left here are mostly the people who keep things going. But wait! He broke off, flicked a switch on the console, and the searchlight flared up brightly. The conversation continued only after the white beam had scoured all three escalators, moved along the ceiling and the walls, and finally died out. Up there, pointing toward the ceiling, the duty officer lowered his voice. Is Pavilitskaya Railway Station? At any rate, it used to be there, a godforsaken place. I don't even know where its tracks have gone. Only that right now something horrible is going on up there. You sometimes hear noises that make your blood run cold, and then when they crawl down... He stopped, and then continued after a minute. We call them the newcomers, these creatures that climb down from up there, out of the train station, so it's not so horrible. Well, a few times, some of the stronger of these newcomers wiped out this cordon. Did you see our train there, the one forced off the tracks? That's how far they got. We wouldn't let them go below where the women and children are. If the newcomers crawled down there, the jig would be up. Our men understood that themselves. And so they retreated to the train, dug in there, and finished off a few creatures. But as for themselves, just two out of ten remained alive. One of the newcomers left crawling off to the Novokuznetskaya station. Some people wanted to go after him in the morning, since the trail of slime he left behind was so thick. But he turned off at a side tunnel, went down, and we didn't dare follow him. We'd had enough disaster as it was. I heard that nobody ever attacks Pavletskaya, Artyom recalled. Is that true? Of course. The duty officer nodded gravely. Who would bother us? If we weren't manning the defenses here, they would be crawling from here all the way along the line. No, nobody is going to lift a finger against us. The Hansa have given us almost all of that transfer passage up to the very end of their blockhouse. They gave us weapons just so that we would protect them. I tell you, they really love to get others to do their dirty work. By the way, what's your name? I'm Mark. Artyom told him his name. Hold it, Artyom. Something is stirring over there, Mark continued, and he quickly switched the searchlight back on. No, I'm probably hearing things, he said uncertainly after a minute. Artyom was filled, drop by drop, with an oppressive sense of danger. Like Mark, he looked above attentively. But where Mark saw only the shadow of the broken lamp, Artyom thought he detected sinister, fantastic silhouettes, motionless in the dazzling beam of light. At first, he thought it was his imagination playing tricks on him, but one of the strange contours stirred just a bit, as soon as a bit of light passed over it. Oh, wait, he whispered. 
Try over in that corner where there's a big crack. Hurry. And as if nailed in place by the light beam, somewhere far off, further than the middle of the escalator, something large and bony froze for a moment and then suddenly swooped down. Mark grabbed the whistle, which almost leapt out of his hand and blew it with all his might, and in a second all those sitting around the fire rushed from their places and scrambled into position. It turned out there was another searchlight there. It was weaker, but cleverly combined with an unusual heavy machine gun. Art Yom had never seen anything like it. The weapon had a long barrel with a bell muzzle at the end. The trailer was shaped like a web, and the cartridges moved along inside the greased and shining ammunition belt. Over there, around the tenth meter. The husky, thin fellow, who had been sitting near Mark, searched about for the newcomer with the beam. Give me the binoculars. Leica, at the tenth on the right side. There it is. We're all here, baby, so sit still, muttered the gunner, aiming the weapon at the hidden black shadow. I have got him. A deafening rumble of machine gun fire burst out. A lamp was blown to smithereens at the tenth meter, and above, something let out a piercing shriek. Looks like we caught him, declared the husky fellow. Okay, give me some more light. There it is, lying there. Finished the vermin. But from above, for a long time, heavy, almost human groans could be heard, leaving Artyom on edge. When he proposed finishing off the newcomer to put it out of its misery, they replied, If you want, go on, kill it. We aren't a shooting gallery here, kiddo. We keep track of every cartridge. Mark was relieved of duty and went over to the fire with Artyom. Mark lit up a cigarette from the fire and Artyom began to listen to the general conversation. Look, Leka was telling us yesterday about the Herr Krishnas. A massive man with a low forehead and a powerful neck was speaking in a low, deep voice. They sit at Oktyabrskoye Pole and want to get into the Korchatov Institute to blow up the nuclear reactor and bring enlightenment for everybody, but they have not yet got their act together to do it. Well, that reminded me of what happened to me four years ago when I was still living at the Savelovskaya. One day I was getting ready to go to the Beloroskaya. My connection was at the Novoslobotskaya, so I went straight through the Hansa. So I got to Beloruskaya, quickly went to the man I needed to meet. We dealt with our affairs, and I figured we ought to celebrate with a drink. So he says to me, you'd better be more careful. Drunks often vanish around here. And I say to him, give me a break, and I won't take no for an answer. So he and I killed a bottle together. The last thing I remember is that he was crawling around on all fours and crying. I am Luno Kud One, the Lunar Rover. Then I wake up, mother of God, tied up, gagged, my noggin shaved, lying in some kind of closet, probably in what used to be a cop shop. What a disaster, say I to myself. After half an hour, some devils come in and drag me to the hall by the scruff of the neck. I had no idea where I was. All the signs carrying place names had been torn down. The walls were smeared with something, the floor bloody, the fires burning. Almost the whole station had been dug up, and there was a deep pit below at least twenty meters, if not thirty. There were stars drawn on the floor and ceiling, all in a single line, you know, the way children draw. Well, I'm wondering, have the reds got me? And then I turned my head around. Not quite. They brought me over to the pit, lowered a rope, and told me to climb down it, and prodded me with an assault rifle. I looked in. There were people piled up at the bottom, digging the pit deeper with pieces of scrap metal and shovels. The earth was being hoisted up with a winch, loaded into wagons, and carted off somewhere. Well, there was nothing I could do, I decided, as long as those fellows were there with their assault rifles. Crazy guys, all of them tattooed from head to toe, a criminal enterprise of some kind. Probably I had landed in the zone, and it's as if these authorities are digging out they want to escape, and these petty hooligans are their hired hands. But then I realized that's all nonsense. What kind of metro zone has no cops? I tell them I'm afraid of heights, that I crash down right onto my head, and that they won't get much use out of me. They conferred among themselves and set me to work loading wagons with dirt that had been brought up from below. The scumbags cuffed me, chained me, and now they expect me to load their wagon. 
But still, I couldn't figure out what they were doing. The job, to put it mildly, was not an easy one. I was lucky. He shrugged his gigantic shoulders. But there were some weaker guys there, so whenever someone collapsed into the dirt, the skinheads would pick him up and drag him off to the stairway. Then I went past one time, and I took a look. They had one guy there, a real blockhead, the type who used to stand in Red Square, where the heads rolled, and he had a good-sized axe stuck in him. There was blood everywhere, and heads were impaled on poles. I nearly puked. No, I think to myself, I'd better get out here before they kill me and make me into a stuffed animal. Okay, and who was it? The husky fellow who sat by the searchlight interrupted impatiently. I asked the men I was loading with. Do you know who? Satanists! Get it? They decided, you see, that the end of the world has already come, and the metro is the gate to hell. And he said something about a circle or something. I don't remember. <laughs> Gateway, the gunner corrected him. Okay. So the metro is the gateway to hell, and hell itself is a little bit deeper down, and the devil, you see, is waiting there for them. They just have to reach him, so they're digging. It's been four years since then. Maybe they've already hit bottom. <laughs> and where is it? The gunner asked. I don't know. By God, I don't know. Well, I sure got myself out of there. I threw myself into the wagon while the guard wasn't watching and sprinkled some dirt over me. I rolled along somewhere for a long time. Then they dumped out the contents of the wagon from high up. I passed out, then came to, crept along, crawled out by some sort of tracks, just keeping on, straight ahead. But these tracks kept crossing other tracks, and my sense of direction deserted me. Then somebody picked me up, and when I woke up I was only at Dubrovka, get it? And the guy who had picked me up had gone off already. Such a nice guy. So I thought, where am I? Then they talked about rumors that at Illich Square and the Rimskaya, there was an epidemic of some kind and many people had died, but Artyom paid no attention. The idea that the metro was the threshold to hell, or maybe even its first circle, mesmerized him. And a bizarre image arose before his eyes. Hundreds of people crawling around like ants, endlessly digging a pit with their hands, a shaft leading nowhere, until one day one of their pieces of scrap metal sticks strangely out of the soil, without sinking down below, and then hell and the metro are finally merged into one. Then it occurred to him that, at this station, people live almost just like at VNDK, constantly attacking monstrous creatures from the surface, holding off the onslaught alone. And if Pavlitskaya faltered, these monsters would spread throughout the line. Which meant that the role of VDNKH is not so unique as he had previously assumed. Who knew how many such stations there were in the metro, each covering its own turf, doing battle, not for the sake of general tranquility, but for its own hide. You could go back, retreat to the center, blow your tunnels up after you, but then you'd be left with less and less residential space until all those who were still alive would be squeezed into a small patch of land and would gnaw their way through one another's gullets. But if VDNK was really nothing special, if there were other exits to the surface that it was impossible to conceal, that meant... Art Yom decided to discontinue that line of thought. It was just the voice of weakness, of treasonous, sugary, seductive arguments not to continue the journey, to stop striving towards the goal. But he mustn't give up. That was a dead end. To distract himself, he resumed listening to the other's conversation. At first they were talking about the chances of somebody named Pushka to win some sort of victory. Then the husky fellow started to talk about how some idiots attacked Kitei Gorod and shot loads of people, but the timely arrival of the Kaluga Brotherhood overpowered them, and the cutthroats went back to Taganskaya. Artyom wanted to point out that it was not Taganskaya at all, but the Tretyakovskaya, but he was prevented from doing so by some scrawny guy whose face was hidden and who said that the Kalugans had pretty much been kicked out of Kitegorod, and now a new group controlled it, which nobody had ever heard of before. The husky dude argued heatedly with him, and Artyom started to nod off. This time he dreamed about nothing at all, and slept so soundly that even when the alarm whistle went off and everyone jumped up, he just couldn't wake up. It was probably a false alarm because no shots were fired. When Mark finally woke him up, it was already a quarter to six. Get up! Time to go on duty! 
He cheerily shook Art Yom by the shoulder. Let's go. I'll show you the passageway that they wouldn't let you into yesterday. Do you have a passport? Art Yom shook his head. Well, never mind. We'll smooth it over somehow, Mark promised. And indeed, after a few minutes, they were already in the passage, and the security officer whistled the go-ahead obligingly, fondling two cartridges. The passageway was very long, even longer than the station itself. There were canvas tents along one wall and rather bright little lamps burning. Hansa takes care of us, Mark smirked, and along the other was a partition. Long, but not high, not more than a meter. By the way, this is one of the longest passageways in the whole metro, Mark said proudly. What's behind the partition, you ask? And you don't know. Why, it's a marvelous thing. Half of everything we earn goes there. Just wait. It's still early. Things will start up later on. It's almost always the same. In the evening, when the entrance to the station is closed and people don't have anything else to do, although there can be qualification rounds during the day. No, really. You've never heard of it? Why, we've got a totalizator for rat races. We call it the Hippodrome. I thought everybody knew about it, he said with surprise, when he finally realized that Ariom was not joking. Do you like to gamble much? I'm a gambler myself. Artyom was certainly interested in watching races, but had never been fanatical about it. Besides, now having slept so long, a storm cloud of guilt was growing and darkening over his head. He couldn't wait until evening, couldn't wait at all. He had to get moving. Too much time had already been wasted. But the way to Paulus led through Hansa, and right now there was no way of getting there. I probably can't stay here until evening, said Artyom. I have to go to Polyanka. <sighs> but then you will be going across Hansa, said Mark with a frown. How are you going to get across Hansa if you have no visa and no passport either? I can't help you there, my friend. But wait, let me throw out an idea. The chief of Pavletskaya, not our Pavletskaya, but the one on the ring, is a great fan of these races. His rat, Pirate, is a favorite. He comes here every night with a security detail and full lighting. How about wagering yourself personally against him? But I haven't got anything to wager with, Artie Yom objected. Wager yourself as a servant, or if you want, I'll wager you. Mark's eyes sparkled with excitement. If we win, you get a visa. If we lose, you'll get there just the same, although, of course, it will be up to you how to get out. Is there an alternative? Artyom did not like this plan. It seemed somehow shameful to sell himself into slavery and, what's more, to lose himself to a rat totalizator. He decided to try to get to Hansa some other way. For a couple of hours, he hung around some stern border guards in dappled gray uniforms. They were dressed exactly like those at Prospect Mir, trying to strike up a conversation with them. But they kept mum. After one of them contemptuously called him one eye, that was unfair because his left eye had already begun to open up, although it still hurt like hell, and told him to buzz off, Art Yom finally abandoned that fruitless effort and started looking for the most sinister and suspicious people at the station, the weapon and drug traders, anyone who might be a contraband runner. But no one wanted to convey Art Yom to Hansa in exchange for his automatic weapon and his lamp. Evening came on, and Artyom met it with quiet despair, sitting on the floor of the passageway and wallowing in self-flagellation. Around this time, the passage became more lively. The adults were returning from work, having dinner with their families. The children were making an uproar until time to go to bed. And finally, after the gate was locked, everyone poured out of their stalls and tents toward the race course. There were lots of people here, at least 300, and finding Mark in such a crowd was no easy job. People were betting on how Pirate was running, whether Pushka would beat him just for once, mentioning various nicknames and other runners, but these two evidently had no competition. The important rat owners approached the starting position, carrying their well-groomed pets in little cages. The chief of Pavletskaya Ring was nowhere to be seen, and Mark also seemed to have disappeared from the face of the earth. Artyom was even afraid that he was on patrol again today and wouldn't come. What in the world would he do then? Finally, a small procession appeared at the other end of the passageway. Walking with an escort of two morose bodyguards, an old man with a shaved head, lush, well-groomed mustaches, glasses, and an austere black suit 
bore his corpulent body along with no hurry with dignity. One of the security guards held a cushioned red velvet box with a latticed wall in which something gray was thrashing about. That, most likely, was the famous pirate. And the bodyguard carried the box with the rat to the starting line, and the mustached old man walked over to the referee sitting behind a little desk, chucked his aide off a chair, sat down heavily in the empty space, and started up a leisurely conversation. The second security man stood nearby, his back to the wall, legs spread wide, and with his hands on the short black automatic hanging around his chest. Such an imposing fellow was not the sort of person with whom to discuss a wager. Even to get close to him was frightening. Then Art Yom saw the sloppily dressed Mark scratching his long, unwashed head, approaching these venerable people and beginning to explain something to the referee. From that distance... All he could hear was the intonation, but he could certainly see that the mustached old man at first flushed with indignation, then grimaced arrogantly, finally nodded with displeasure, took off his glasses, and started to clean them. Artyom made his way through the crowd to the starting position where Mark was standing. Everything is hush-hush, Mark announced, rubbing his hands with glee. Asked exactly what he had in mind, Mark explained that he had just thrust a personal bet upon the old chief that his own new rat would outrun the favorite on the first round. He had to put Art Wom up for it, Mark reported, but in exchange, he demanded a visa for all of Hansa for Artyom and himself. The chief, to be sure, rejected the proposal, saying that he doesn't engage in the slave trade. Artyom breathed a sigh of relief, but adding that such presumptuous insolence would have to be punished. If their rat lost, Mark and Artyom would have to clean the latrines at Pavletskaya ring for one year. If the rat won, then okay, they would get the visa. Of course, he was positive that the second option was out of the question, which is why he agreed. He decided to punish the cocky upstarts who had dared to throw down a challenge to his pet. Do you have your rat? Artyom asked cautiously. Of course, Mark reassured him. A real brute. She'll tear pirate to shreds. Do you know how she ran away from me today? I could barely catch her. I chased her nearly to Novokuznetskaya. And what's her name? Her name? Sure, what's her name? Well, let's say Rocket, Mark proposed. Rocket? Does that sound menacing? Artyom was not sure that the competition was really intended to see whose rat would tear a rival to pieces, but he kept his mouth shut. When Mark explained that he had only caught his rat today, Artyom couldn't stand it. And so how do you know she's going to win? I believe in her, Artyom, Mark proclaimed solemnly. And anyhow, you see, I really wanted to have my own rat for a long time. I used to bet on other people's rats. They would lose. And I would think to myself, never mind. The day will come when I will have my own. And she'll bring me luck. But I never decided to do it. After all, it's not that simple. You have to get permission from the referee. That's such a drag. My whole life will go by. Some newcomer will gobble me up or I'll die all on my own and I'll never have my own rat. And then you turned up. And I thought, here we go. It's now or never. If you don't take a risk now, I said to myself, then you'll always be betting on someone else's rat. And I decided... If I'm going to play, then let me play for high stakes. Of course, I want to help you, but excuse me for saying that that's not the main thing. And so I wanted to go right up to that old fart. Mark lowered his voice and say, I'll wager myself against your pirate. He got so enraged that he forced the referee to certify my rat out of turn. And you know, he added barely audible, this moment will be followed by a year of cleaning the latrines because our rat will surely lose. Art Yom desperately tried to reason with him for the last time. Mark looked at him attentively, then smiled and said, But what if... But what if... Having sternly looked over the audience, the referee smoothed his graying hair, cleared his throat with self-importance, and began to read off the nicknames of the rats taking part in the race. Rocket was last, but Mark didn't pay any attention to that. Pirate got more applause than any others, and only Artyom clapped for Rocket because Mark's hands were occupied holding the cage. Artyom was still hoping for a miracle that would spare him from an ignominious end in a stinking abyss.
Then the referee fired a blank from his Makarov, and the owners opened the cages. Rocket was the first to break out, and Artyom's heart leapt with joy. But then, while the other rats charged off along the length of the passageway, some slower, some faster, Rocket, not living up to her proud name, got stuck in a corner five meters from the starting line, and there she stayed. It was against the rules to prod the rats. Artyom glanced at Mark apprehensively, expecting that he would either start getting violent or, on the contrary, would languish, overwhelmed with grief. But the stern, proud expression on Mark's face reminded him more of that of the captain of the cruiser who gave the order to sink a warship to prevent the enemy from capturing it, a story about some war between the Russians and somebody else that he'd in a beat-up book lying in the library at the V.D. Ank. After a couple of minutes, the first rats reached the finish line. Pirate won. Second place was some creature with an unintelligible name. Pushka came in third. Artyom cast a glance at the referee table. The old guy with a mustache wiping the sweat of excitement from his bald pate with the same cloth he had used earlier to clean his glasses was discussing the results with the referee. Artyom was already expecting that they would forget about them when the old man suddenly slapped himself on the forehead and, smiling sweetly, beckoned to Mark. Artyom felt almost like he did at the moment when they took him off for execution, although the sensation was not as strong. Making his way behind Mark to the referee's table, he comforted himself with the fact that, one way or another, the coast was now clear for him to cross Hansa territory. The only trick was to find a way to escape. But disgrace awaited him. Shrewdly inviting them to come up to the dais, Mustache turned to the audience and briefly explained the wager. Then loudly proclaimed that both rascals were being sent, as agreed, to clean out the sanitary facilities for one year, starting today. Two Hansa border guards appeared from God knows where, took away Artyom's automatic weapon, assuring him that his main opponent in the coming year would not be dangerous and promising to return the weapon at the end of the sentence. Then, suffering the whistling and hooting of the crowd, they were led off to the ring. The passage went under the floor at the center of the hall, just as at the other station of the same name, but there the similarity between the two Pavaletskayas ended. The one on the ring conveyed a very strange impression. On one side, the ceiling was low, and there were no real columns at all. Arches spanned equal intervals along the wall, with the width of each arch being the same as the width of the gap between them. It seemed as though the first Pavaletskaya had been easy for the builders, as if the dirt there was softer and all one had to do was push one's way across it. Whereas at the other Pavaletskaya there was some hard, unyielding rock, which was a real pain to chew through. But for some reason, this place did not produce the depressing, melancholy feeling that the Tverskaya did. Maybe because here there was so much light, and the walls were decorated with simple designs and imitations of ancient columns, like in the pictures from myths of ancient Greece. In short, this was not the worst place for forced labor. And, of course, it was clear right away that this was Hansa territory. First of all, it was unusually clean, Comfortable and large, real lamps cased in glass shone softly from the ceiling. In the hall itself, which, to be sure, was not as spacious as at the twin station, there was not a single kiosk, though there were many work tables piled with mountains of intricate contraptions. Behind them sat people in blue overalls, and a pleasant smell, the light odor of machine oil, hung in the air. Probably the workday ended later than at the Pavletskaya radial line. Hansa paraphernalia hung on the walls, an insignia with a brown circle on a white background, posters, appeals to raise labor productivity, and quotes from somebody named A. Smith. Under the largest flag, between the two stiff soldiers in an honor guard, stood a glass table. And Artyom lingered there as he passed, just to satisfy his curiosity about what sacred object might lie beneath the glass. There, on red velvet, lovingly lit with tiny lamps, lay two books. The first was a magnificently preserved, imposing volume with a black cover and a gold-embossed inscription that read, Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations. The second 
was a thoroughly dog-eared copy of a pocketbook, a piece of trash with a battered dust jacket that was torn and glued together again, on which thick letters spelled out Dale Carnegie. How to stop worrying and start living. Art Yom had never heard of either author, so what interested him much more was whether the station chief had used remnants of this very velvet to upholster the cage of his beloved rat. One line was not blocked, and trolleys traveled by from time to time, most of them hand-powered, loaded with boxes. But once a motorized trolley passed, enveloped in a cloud of smoke, and paused for a minute at the station before continuing further. Archom was able to get a look at the strong soldiers, with black uniforms and black and white striped vests, who were sitting on it. Each had night vision equipment on his head, a strange short automatic weapon against his chest and heavy body armor. The commander, stroking the enormous dark green visored helmet that sat on his knees, exchanged a few words with the station security officers, dressed in the usual gray camouflage, and the trolley vanished into the tunnel. On the second line, there was a complete train, in even better condition than the one Artyom had seen at Kuznetsky Bridge. There were probably living quarters behind the curtained windows, but through bare windows one could see desks with printers on them, behind which sat your usual business types, and engraved upon a sign over the door were the words Central Office. This station produced an indescribable impression on Artyom. It was not that it amazed him like the first Pavletskia. There were no traces here of that mysterious, somber splendor that reminded one of the degenerated descendants of bygone superhuman greatness and the power of those who had built the metro. But still, people lived here just as if they were not part of the teeming, decadent, senseless, underground existence outside the ring line. Life went on in a steady, well-organized way. After the workday, there was a well-deserved rest. Young people did not go out into a fantasy world of foolish yentas, but to business. The earlier you started your career, the farther up the ladder you could move. And adults were not afraid that as soon as their strength began to ebb, they would be turned out into the tunnel to be eaten by rats. It now became comprehensible why Hansa allowed only a few outsiders into its station, and reluctantly at that. The number of places in paradise is limited. Only in hell is entry open to all. Why, finally, I've emigrated, exclaimed Mark, looking happily about him. At the end of the platform, another border guard sat in a glass cubicle with the sign, On Duty, beside a rather small barrier, painted with white and red stripes. When someone drove up to the duty officer, stopping respectfully, the guard came out of the cubicle with an expression of self-importance, inspected documents and sometimes cargo, and finally lifted the barrier. Art Yom noted that all the border guards and customs officials were very proud of their posts. It was immediately obvious that they were doing something they enjoyed. On the other hand, he thought, how could one not like such work? They were taken over to a fence from which the road extended into the tunnel and turned off to the side to a corridor for staff quarters. Dreary yellow tile with scooped out pit holes proudly crowned with real toilet seats indescribably filthy overalls, square shovels with some weird stuff growing on them, a wheelbarrow with only one wheel, making wild figure eights, carts that were to be loaded up and carted off to the nearest shaft that led into the depths. And all this was enveloped in a monstrous, unimaginable stench, saturating one's clothes, seeping into each hair from root to tip penetrating beneath the skin so that you began to think that it had become part of your very nature and would be with you forever, scaring away your own kind and making them get out of your way before they've even seen you. The first day of this monotonous work passed so slowly that Art Ayam decided they had been given an infinite shift. Dig, dump, roll, dig again, dump again, roll again, drain, then go back the other way just so that this thrice-damned cycle could be repeated. There was no end in sight to the work, since new visitors kept coming. Neither they nor the security guards, standing at the entrance to the premises and at the end point of their route at the shaft, hid their revulsion for the poor laborers. They stood aside squeamishly, holding their noses, or the more delicate among them took a deep breath beforehand so as not to have to inhale next to Artyom and Mark. 
Their faces showed such loathing that Artyom asked himself, In surprise, didn't all this crap come from their guts in the first place? At the end of the day, when his hands were worn to a pulp, despite wearing enormous canvas gloves, it seemed to Artyom that he had discovered the true nature of man, as well as the meaning of life. He now viewed man as a clever machine for the decomposition of food and the production of shit, functioning almost without a hitch throughout a life without meaning, if, by the word meaning, one has in mind some kind of ultimate goal. The meaning was in the process, to break down the most food possible, convert it even faster, and eliminate the dregs, everything that was left of smoking pork chops, juicy braised mushrooms, fluffy cakes, now rotten and contaminated. Personality traits began to fade, becoming impersonal mechanisms for the destruction of the beautiful and the useful, creating instead something putrid and worthless. Ardiom was disgusted with people and felt no less aversion to them than they to him. Mark was stoically patient and tried to cheer up Artyom from time to time by saying things like, Don't worry about it. They told me beforehand that emigration is always difficult at the beginning. And the main thing was that neither on the first nor the second day did any possibility of escape present itself. The security guards were vigilant, and although the only thing Artyom and Mark would have to do to escape was to enter the tunnel beyond the shaft heading toward Dobrininskaya, that was simply impossible. They spent the night in a nearby closet. The door was locked carefully at night, and whatever the time of day, a guard sat at the glass booth by the entrance to the station. The third day of their stay at the station arrived. Time here did not pass according to the usual 24-hour day. It crawled along like a slug in the seconds of an unending nightmare. Artyom had already grown accustomed to the idea that nobody would ever approach him and talk to him again, and that the fate of a pariah was in store for him. It was as though he were no longer human and had turned into an inconceivably monstrous being, whom people saw not just as something ugly and repulsive, but also somehow perceptibly related to themselves. And that scared them and repulsed them even more, as if they might catch this monstrousness from him, as if he were a leper. First, he worked out an escape plan. Then came a resounding void of despair. After that, a dull stupor took over, in which his intellect was disconnected from his life. He turned inward, drew in the threads of feeling and sensation, and went into a cocoon somewhere in a remote corner of consciousness. Artyom continued to work mechanically, his motions as precise as those of an automaton. All he had to do was dig, dump, roll, and dig again, roll again, drain, and go back the other way, faster to start digging again. His dreams lost any meaning, and in them, just as in his waking hours, he endlessly ran, dug, pushed, pushed, dug, and ran. On the evening of the fifth day, Artyom, pushing the wheelbarrow, tripped over a shovel that had been left on the floor. The wheelbarrow overturned, the contents spilled, and then he fell down into it himself. When he arose slowly from the floor, an idea suddenly popped into his head, and instead of running for a bucket and cloth, he slowly and deliberately headed for the entrance to the tunnel. He himself could feel that he was now so loathsome, so repulsive, that his aura would have to drive anyone away. And just at the moment, due to an improbable confluence of circumstances, the security guard who was invariably hanging around at the end of his route was, for some reason, not there. Without giving a moment's thought to whether someone might be chasing him, Artyom started off across the ties. Blinded, but hardly stumbling, he walked faster and faster until breaking into a run. But his reason had not returned to the job of directing his body, it was still holed up, cowering in its corner. Behind him he heard no shouts, no footsteps of pursuers. Only the trolley clattered by, loaded with cargo, and lighting its way with a dim lantern. Artyom simply pressed himself against the wall, letting it go past. The people on board either didn't notice him or did not consider it necessary to pay him any attention. Their gazes passed over him without lingering, and they didn't say a word. Suddenly he was seized with a feeling of his own invulnerability, conferred on him by his fall. Covered with stinking sludge, it was as if he had become invisible. This gave him strength, and consciousness gradually began to return. He had done it. Who knew how? 
Against all good sense, despite everything, he had managed to escape from the accursed station and nobody was even following him. It was strange. It was amazing. But it seemed to him that if he were only to try right now to comprehend what had happened, to dissect the miracle with the cold scalpel of rationality, then the magic would dissipate immediately and the beam of the searchlight from a patrol trolley would quickly strike him in the back. Light shone at the end of the tunnel. He slackened his pace, and after a minute, he was at Dobrininskaya. The border guard there satisfied himself with the simple question, Did they call for a sanitary technician? And quickly let him through, waving away the air around himself with one hand, while holding the other over his mouth. Artyom had to keep moving, to get out of Hansa territory fast, before the security guards finally gathered their wits before he could hear behind him the tramp of iron-rimmed jackboots, before warning shots thundered out into the air, and then, faster. Not looking at anyone, keeping his eyes to the floor, his skin crawling with the disgust those around him felt for him, a vacuum forming around him so that he did not have to elbow his way through the dense crowd, Art Yom strode to the border post. And now, what was he going to say? More questions, more demands to present his passport. How could he reply? Artyom's head hung so low that his chin touched his chest, and he saw absolutely nothing around him, so that the only things he remembered about the whole station were the dark, neatly arranged granite slabs of the floor. He kept walking, frozen with anticipation of the moment when he would hear the peremptory order to stand still. Hansa's border was closer and closer. Now! Right now! What kind of rubbish is this? A gasping voice resounded in his ear. There it was. <laughs> it... I got lost. Uh, I'm not from here, muttered Artyom, tongue-tied from nervousness or maybe just getting into his role. Well, get the hell out of here. Do you hear, you ugly mug? The voice sounded very persuasive, almost hypnotic, making him want to obey right away. Sure, I... I would, mumbled Artyom. Afraid, not knowing how to get out of this one. Begging is strictly forbidden on Hansa territory, the voice said sternly, and this time it was from a greater distance. Of course, right away. I have little children. Artyom finally realized what button to press and became more animated. What children? Are you nuts? The invisible border guard flew into a rage. Popov! Lamako! Come here! Get this scumbag out of here! Neither Popov nor Lamako wanted to soil their hands by touching Artyom, so they just shoved him in the back with the barrels of their automatics. Their superior's angry curses flew after them. To Artyom, this sounded like heavenly music. Serpukovskaya Station, he had left the Hansa behind. Finally, he looked up, but what he saw in the eyes of the people surrounding him made him look back at the floor. This was not tidy Hansen territory. He was once again in the midst of the dirty, poverty-stricken bedlam that reigned throughout the rest of the metro. But even here, Artyom was too loathsome. The miraculous armor that had saved him along the way, making him invisible, forcing people to turn away from the fugitive and not to notice him, to let him through all the outposts and checkpoints, had now turned back into a stinking, shitty scab. Evidently, it was already past noon. Now that the initial exultation had worn off, that strange strength, as if borrowed from someone else, which had forced him to keep walking across the stretch from Pavletskaya to Dobrininskaya, abruptly disappeared and left him alone with himself, hungry, deathly tired, without a penny to his name, giving off an unbearable stench, still showing traces of the blows of the week before. The paupers next to whom he had sat down along the wall decided that they could no longer abide such company, crawled away from him, cursing in various directions, and he was left completely alone. Hugging his shoulder so as not to feel so cold, he closed his eyes and sat there for a long while, thinking about absolutely nothing until sleep overcame him. Artyom was walking along an unfinished tunnel. It was longer than all those he had traversed throughout his whole life rolled into one. The tunnel twisted and turned, sometimes ascending, sometimes descending, but was never straight for more than ten paces. 
but it just went on and on, and walking became harder and harder. His feet blistered and bloody were hurting. His back ached. Each new step called forth an echo of pain throughout his body. But as long as hope remained that the exit was not far away, maybe just around that next corner, Art Yom found the strength to keep going. But then suddenly the simple but terrifying thought occurred to him, what if the tunnel had no exit? If both the entrance and exit were closed, if someone invisible and omnipotent had shut him off, left him thrashing around like a rat unsuccessfully trying to reach the experimenter's finger in this maze without exit, so that he would keep dragging himself along until he gave out, until he collapsed, and doing this for no reason, just for fun. A rat in a maze, a squirrel in a wheel. But then, he thought, if continuing along the road does not lead to the exit, will refusing any senseless forward motion perhaps bestow liberation? He sat down on a railway tie, not because he was tired, but because he was at the end of his rope. The walls around him disappeared, and he thought, in order to achieve the goal, to complete the journey, all I have to do is to stop walking. Then this thought faded away and disappeared. When he woke up, he was seized by overwhelming anxiety, and at first could not imagine what had caused it. Only later did he begin to recall bits of the dream, to piece together a mosaic from these fragments. But the fragments just would not hold together. They crumbled. There was not enough glue to hold them together. That glue was some idea that had come to him during his dream. It was pivotal, a vision from the heart, and very important to him. Without it, all that was left was a pile of ragged underwear. But with it, a wonderful picture, full of miraculous import, opening up limitless horizons. But he couldn't remember the idea. Archom gnawed on his fists, seized his dirty head with his dirty hands. His lips whispered something incomprehensible, and passers-by looked at him with fear and aversion. But the idea just didn't want to return. Then slowly, carefully, as if trying to use a strand of hair to pull out something stuck in a swamp, he started to reconstruct the idea out of the fragments of memory. And what a miracle! Deftly grabbing hold of one of the images, he suddenly recognized it in the same primordial form that it had first announced itself in his dream. To finish the journey, he only needed to stop walking. But now, in the bright light of waking consciousness, the thought seemed to him banal, pitiful, unworthy of attention. To finish the journey, he needed to stop walking? Well, of course. If you stop walking then your journey is over. What could be simpler? But is that really the way out? And could that really be the conclusion of the journey? It often happens that an idea that appears in a dream to be a stroke of genius turns out to be a meaningless jumble of words when one wakes up. Oh, my beloved brother, filth on your body and in your soul. The voice was right next to him. That was as unexpected as the return of the idea, and the bitter taste of that disillusionment instantly vanished. He didn't even think the voice was addressing him, since he had already become so accustomed to the idea that people fled in all directions even before he could utter a word. We welcome all the orphaned and wretched, the voice continued. It sounded so soft, so reassuring, so tender, that Art Yom, no longer restraining himself, cast a sideways glance to the left, and then gloomily glanced to the right, afraid to discover that the person speaking was actually addressing somebody else. But there was nobody else nearby. The person was talking to him. Then he slowly raised his head and met the eyes of a rather short, smiling man, wearing a loose-fitting robe with dark blonde hair and rosy cheeks, who was reaching out his hand in friendship. It was vital for Arham to reciprocate, so not daring to smile, he too extended his hand. Why isn't he recoiling from me like everybody else, thought Ardiom. He's even ready to shake my hand. Why did he come up to me on his own when everyone around was trying to get as far away from me as possible? I will help you, my brother, the rosy-cheeked fellow continued. The brothers and I will give you shelter and restore your spiritual strength. Uh, Archeom just nodded, but his new companion found that sufficient. So allow me to take you to the watchtower, oh, my beloved brother, he intoned, and firmly taking Archeom by the hand, drew him along. Archeom did not remember much, and certainly didn't remember the road, but 
only understood that he was being led from the station into a tunnel, but which of the four he did not know. His new acquaintance introduced himself as Brother Timothy. On the road and at the gray, mundane Serpukovskaya station and in the dark tunnel, he never stopped talking. Rejoice, O oh beloved brother of mine, that you met me on your way, for your life is about to undergo a momentous change. The cheerless gloom of your aimless wandering is at an end, because you will attain that which you seek. Artyom did not understand very well what the man had in mind, because for him personally his wanderings were far from over. But the rosy-cheeked and gentle Timothy spoke so smoothly and tenderly that he just wanted to keep on listening, to communicate with him in the same language, grateful for not rejecting him, when the whole world rejected him. Do you believe in the one true God, O oh brother Artyom? Timothy inquired, as if, by the way, looking Artyom attentively in the eyes. Artyom could only shake his head in an indefinite way and mumble something unintelligible which could be interpreted as desired, either as agreement or rejection. That's good. That's wonderful, brother Artyom, Timothy exclaimed. Only belief in the truth will save you from the torments of eternal hell and grant you expiation of your sins. Because, he assumed a stern and triumphal expression, the kingdom of the God of our Jehovah is coming, and the holy biblical prophecies will be fulfilled. Do you study the Bible, O oh brother? Artyom mumbled again, and the rosy-cheeked fellow this time looked at him with some misgivings. When we get to the watchtower, your own eyes will convince you that you must study the holy book given to us from on high and that great blessings will come to those who have turned to the path of truth. The Bible, a precious gift of the God of our Jehovah, can only be compared to a letter from a loving father to his young son, Brother Timothy added, for good measure. Do you know who wrote the Bible? He asked Artyom a bit sternly, 